Okay. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me because um, I think, uh, as I said in my um, in my title, it's important to uh, to create some uh, bridges between different communities of people who have the same goal. So. Um, First, uh, before, before we get started, I would like just to, um, to give you a, a quick reminder about um, uh, animal conservation. Uh, you know that we are losing a lot of biodiversity on the planet because of a lot of detrimental human activities, especially destruction of natural habitat, but also overhunting or poaching of some species. And uh, as a result, as you can see here, we have a really uh, high proportion of those uh, vertebrates that are now extinct uh, or threatened in the wild. But what also you have to keep in mind is not only about animal species, but it's also plant species. You have more than 50% of plant species on the planet now that are really threatened in the natural habitat. Uh, interestingly, there is also a loss of biodiversity at large, and that's uh, really referring to heritage breeds and more local breeds that have been little by little replaced by more like commercial and high uh, producing uh, species for meat, egg, milk, and, and fiber production. And this loss of heritage breeds is also a little bit a problem in some areas of the world. So in terms of really the, the core of animal conservation for wild species is really to maintain what we call genetic diversity. And uh, of course, we're not trying to do any selections in the animals that we have the control. And uh, of course, we're trying to do some propagation, what we call in situ, it's more like in the wild or ex situ, it's in research centers, in ranches or in zoos. And usually we have to deal with small populations. But then, of course, the objective is to, then after that, when we are able to produce enough animals to reintroduce them in the wild when they've been extinct in their natural habitat or to reinforce some existing populations. So, of course, the priority number one is really the protection of the natural habitat. And as you can see, it's already a complex task and it involves a lot of different disciplines. But on the other side of the spectrum, you have the need to understand really basic, basic biology of those different species. And again, this is a really multidisciplinary approach, including, of course, veterinary medicine, but you know, a lot of other areas like ecology or genetics. And now we have more and more tools to really help to make progress with this you know, accumulation of knowledge, basic knowledge about the species. Of course, within this puzzle of, you know, different actions for animal conservation, there is reproductive science. And this is, of course, you know, extremely important because we want to know exactly how animals are reproducing. Uh, we want to understand the basic traits of their biology, of their ovarian cycles, their behavior. And this is extremely important because just by the fact of accumulating and generating this really scholarly knowledge, we can already make some decisions, informed decision on conservation actions. We can enhance the natural mating, but we also can, of course, maintain genetic diversity. But in some cases, we need to go to the next step. But again, we can't go to that step of assisted reproduction and genome resource banking before really trying to understand the basic traits of reproduction. So again, this is, you know, to try to overcome different types of infertilities. And again, the, uh, the idea is to still to maintain this genetic diversity to avoid inbreeding and any other problems related to, you know, the lack of genetic diversity. Of course, what we learned over the past uh, decades, uh, even before I started really to work in that area, is that we can't really do any oversimplification. And here is just a, a really, really small example of how anatomy also can be really different. Those are different mammals. So this is a, 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 a uterus with two really long horns of a cheetah. This is the uterus of a tufted deer. And you can see here that there is a just 
a small ring for the cervix, and in comparison, this is the cervix of an else deer that has, you know, those different, you know, rings that are more familiar to what you know in, uh, in bovines. And interestingly enough, in the oryx, which is this really large antelope from northern Africa, you have actually the cervix has two different entrances, which means that it's a little bit also tricky when you want to do artificial insemination on those species. Well, difference in anatomies, reproductive traits, of course, there is all, we know that the cheetah has nothing to do with a red panda or a killer whale, but funnily enough, even in the cat family, there are a lot of differences also. And all in all, as you can see here, in terms of really knowing well the reproductive species of those endangered species, I mean, this is, you know, just a small number of animals that we know, and for your information, there are about 5,500 mammal species on the planet, and we only know really well 100 in terms of reproduction. Then those specificities, you can also find them whenever you try to develop those assisted reproductive techniques with, you know, hormonal stimulations have to be adapted, but also cryopreservation in vitro culture of embryos. And of course, fertility issues really vary from one species to, to the other. You have some commonalities, for example, but uh, you also have some, you know, unique issues like teratospermia, in uh, carnivores or aging issue in elephants or stress of captivities in a lot of gazelles and, and deer species affecting the reproduction. So what's the current status on Italy when, when you talk about assisted reproductive techniques in, uh, in wild species? Uh, first of all, uh, artificial insemination with fresh or frozen semen. I mean, we only talk about two success stories, honestly, in terms of really having species that, of uh, having the assisted reproductive uh, technique completely integrated into the management plan of the captive population. And this is really true for the black-footed ferret, which is an endemic species from Northern America, and for the giant panda. Then there are some also good progress made on the koala, or even now what we are doing with the, the, the oryx, which is this antelope from Northern Africa. But the progress is extremely slow because we are always facing some basic knowledge that we, enfin, the lack of knowledge that uh, are necessary to make the progress. Some, in a lot of conditions also in zoos or research centers, you know, they don't have necessarily the, the, the facility to, to handle the animals and to do those procedures. So that's a problem. There is also a lack of expertise and a number of people really interested in doing that. And of course, this is related to the fact that we don't have a lot of money also to do these really fancy techniques, unfortunately. In terms of uh, embryo transfer, there were some encouraging results reported in the mid uh, 80s with those interspecific embryo transfer of wild bovies into domestic cow uh, or within even between different uh, wild bovids. But honestly, at this point, there is not a single species that's currently managed with the help of embryo technology in, in, the, in wild animals, unfortunately. And uh, actually, as I said before, assisted reproduction is not always necessary, by the way, to really maintain genetic diversity and to save those species from, from extinction. Sometimes just a better husbandry is really a, do a good job. But uh, in some cases also, it's kind of a little bit interesting and crazy because sometimes we have the money like for the northern white rhino, but uh, honestly, given the small number of animals left on the planet, even if we are developing, trying to develop the most sophisticated assisted reproductive techniques, honestly, it's a really, really late in the process when you just have like five animals, you know, that you can use to really regenerate a full population. Associated with assisted reproductive techniques, of course, genome resource banking, cryobiology, so we are mainly uh, freezing semen. We don't do a lot of uh, embryos, and of course, we also freeze cell lines for genetic studies and DNA samples, blood products. 
But all in all, again, there are not a lot of really large biobanks in zoos and conservation centers around the world because it's expensive to maintain and also you need a lot of space and you need also sophisticated uh, equipment. And here I just want to, to, to mention the effort that we are um, uh, providing with, uh, with our colleagues from the SVF Foundation. We are building a new facility in Front Royal, Virginia uh, that, has, that will be really the state-of-the-art repository where we're going to get some of their collections of uh, uh, heritage breeds, but also we're going to have our own collections of uh, wild species. So in terms of uh, crow preservation, honestly, we are extremely jealous uh, about the, 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 the progress that has been made in the cattle industry and how standardized uh, freezing bull semen has become and the number of possibilities that are now to, to, to use artificial insemination with frozen sperm. And in some cases, it's been really directly uh, applicable to some species, but unfortunately, crow preservation is also really species specific because, again, when you go back to the basics about cryoprotectant tolerance, resistance to cold, or freezing temperature, everything is extremely different from one species to the other. And you have to really understand those basic uh, traits of cryobiology before being able to systematically, consistently freeze um, uh, biomaterial. So another example, I was referring to the, to the giant panda, is to, to show you a little bit how we, we, we proceeded. So first of all, uh, we had to understand the reproductive cycle in the, in the female and in the male. So in the female, using non-invasive techniques, uh, uh, just measuring the um, estrogen metabolized in the urine, we were able to detect really this peak of estrogen that happens only once a year. So you don't want to miss really the, the window of opportunity. We know that fertilization has to do just to, to occur just after that. And then after that, you have this kind of arrays of progesterone that unfortunately, that we also monitor, but unfortunately doesn't tell you anything about uh, the presence of a fetus in, uh, in, uh, in the uterus. But still, the most important was to know that we can detect really the natural estrus. So we monitor this uh, natural estrus. We usually do a uh, single um, artificial insemination either with fresh or frozen semen or sometimes a mix of them. Just 18 hours, so we, we uh, we look for really this peak of estrogen, and then at the estrogen drop, we about, you know, theoretically uh, 18 hours post ovulation, we can do the, of the artificial insemination. Directly, it's not really difficult in the giant panda because the cervix, the, the vagina is really short, the cervix is right there, and it's not really difficult to pass when the female is ready, so uh, it's not a really difficult uh, process. And we use fresh or frozen semen, and also we're lucky because in the giant panda, uh, freezing semen is not really difficult because the, fr the, the panda semen is pretty uh, resistant to cold and, and freezing temperature. So you can see that we've been able to make a difference using this, those tools, those really basic knowledge and then those tools from, you know, 121 individuals, you know, in the 90s. Now we are more than 420 in captivity in 2016, which is extremely good. And as you can see, the genetic diversity is pretty good also. So we have reached that level where we know that we have a sustainable population in captivity. And now we can think of the next step, which is uh, the reintroduction. Another example, uh, artificial insemination in elephant. The way we proceeded again, it required a lot of basic studies of endocrinology and what's really fascinating in elephants, first of all, the cycles, the, the ovarian cycles are really long, they are three months cycles. But what we discovered is that when the female is ready to ovulate, she has actually two LH peaks that are um, just a couple of days apart. And just, you know, being able to detect the first peak tells you that, well, to be ready for the second one because this is when you're going to have ovulation and the female is going to be ready for artificial insemination. So artificial insemination in an elephant is a little bit tricky because the opening of the vagina 
it's here between the legs and it makes sense because at birth, of course, when the calf is born, you don't want the calf to fall from a really high distance. So you want to have a, a, a calf, you know, born and not, you know, um, uh, injured at, the, at birth. And so, but you have to really go to this really long, that's it, so more than one meter long, you know, vagina, and then find the entrance of the, the, the uterus, and then after that, uh, the cervix, and then after that, monitor, you know, the, through uh, uh, with ultrasound, the, the passage of the, the, the catheter. So, uh, in terms of, again, single semen deposition at a really good specific timing, uh, more than 60 cows uh, from elephant born by artificial insemination. Unfortunately, freezing semen elephant is extremely challenging, and uh, we've been only uh, successful uh, with cooled, fresh or cooled semen. But anyway, you can see that here it's a really, uh, again, valuable uh, um, breeding tool. Now in terms of um, uh, in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer, I'm gonna give you a quick example of uh, what we're doing in, um, in else deer, which is uh, uh, a deer species from Southeast Asia. And this is a, a project that we have in, uh, in Thailand. Um, so we've been able to uh, kind of uh, design this, um, this uh, plan for ovarian stimulation, uh, which is something that's not going to really surprise you if you are familiar with uh, other, you know, more like uh, common deer species. But uh, what's really tricky and what we had a hard time to understand at the beginning is that when you insert a cider, uh, in, a, in a deer, the problem is that they are metabolizing really, really quickly the, the, the progestagen. So you have, after seven days, to replace the cider. Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise sorry, one single cider is not going to be you know, enough to sustain a high level of progestagen for uh, 14 days. Uh, and again, you know, this is kind of a, you know, trial error and uh, a little bit of um, uh, hesitation that we had, you know, at the beginning to try to find, you know, the right way. And then after that, we do uh, ovum pickup, of course, you know, under anesthesia. Um, IVM of uh, maturation, fertilization, we have developed, my colleagues from New Zealand have developed a, a kind of a, an adapted medium also. And as you can see, so don't look too closely at those embryos. I know that uh, they probably don't look as good as uh, what you can get in, uh, in bovine. But the problem that we had is that, as you can see, it's not really clear, but the, the, the percentage of blastocyst formation is extremely low. So uh, we were able to collect a fair amount of eggs, but uh, we were not satisfied with the low percentage of blastocysts. For, so for the transfer, we had really to do early embryo transfer. And when you do early embryo transfer, as you know, it has to be done directly into the oviduct. So we transfer embryos at the two, four cell stage. Um, as you can see, of course, we have uh, the same problem as in, you know, uh, domestic uh, bovids with uh, a loss, of early embryo loss, and uh, not, you know, that many successful um, uh, birth. But we were successful at least to, to produce some animals, and, and some of those animals then after that were again uh, subjected to the same treatment of IVF and embryo transfer and able also to produce, you know, offspring. So this is a program that's getting started. We cannot, again, we cannot really claim that we are managing the, the captive population of elves deer using embryo transfer, but this is really encouraging. So anyway, um, as you can see, w w we are making some progress and we are using kind of, um, let's say, basic techniques, you know, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization. But uh, the problem is that we can't, this is not enough. This is not enough because in a lot of, you know, species, we have a very, very small, you know, number of individuals. Uh, and th among those individuals, of course, the most valuable, the most genetically valuable females, you can be sure that they're gonna be acyclic. Same for the males. For some reason, they're going to have those infertility syndromes that we cannot really understand. And then, all in all, you know, those females and those males, they are getting old and they haven't reproduced. And of course, oh, they live longer in captivity, but they start to develop then after that some issues related to aging. So this is extremely complicated. So we need really to develop all those different fertility preservation uh, approaches 
in order to maximize really the use of the valuable genomes of all individuals that we have, currently have, you know, available. But we want also to protect, you know, fertility of propubertal animals, especially when we lose, you know, a calf or a pup or a cub, you know, before puberty, we want to be able to recover the gonadal tissues and then after that to produce some uh, gametes that will be able to produce embryos. We want, as I said, you know, uh, uh, address the issue of aging and try to extend the fertility period of those uh, females. And of course, what we can do is to recover, you know, post-mortem whenever you, we lose an animal uh, unexpectedly, we want to develop, you know, all the different techniques possible to recover the genetic material that will help us to produce, you know, embryo later on. So in this kind of uh, context, for us, it's obvious that there is a huge value for, you know, uh, the, the, the value of livestock species for the, the species that we are trying to, to protect. And this is, you know, looking at what you are all doing, this is extremely inspiring and we need to keep, you know, an eye on what you're doing and what you are developing, what you are, you know, discovering also. And, um, of course, that will help us to do more, you know, progress on basi basic, and it has already been the case, you know, uh, using, you know, your techniques for, for endocrinology or molecular biology. Genomics now is something that we are integrating little by little, and we are even, you know, using some genotyping arrays that have been developed in, uh, in uh, dairy cattle, for example, for some of our antelopes. But we want also <coughs> to be inspired by the new method that you are coming up with ovarian stimulation, synchronization, and then, of course, you know, all the techniques of assisted reproduction, plus, of course, the sex sorted semen. That is a prime that we have also in captivity because we have a skewed sex ratio. We have too many males, especially in antelope and, uh, and gazelle species, which is an, a, a problem in terms of management. But um, as I said, even if we can be really inspired from what you do in your regular practice, the big also difference that we have is that we are dealing with those wild animals that are not really easy to handle, that are stressed, and that can be also dangerous. So there are just a few species. While you saw the picture of the elephant, an elephant under sedation can let you, you know, do all the artificial insemination, but they have to be trained. But most of the other species, and especially carnivores, we can't do anything on an animal when he's awake. So we have always to use anesthesia. So which is also kind of a, uh, another complicating factor because under anesthesia, of course, sometimes you change also the quality of well, the contraction of the uterus and the success of the um, artificial insemination. But what's also interesting to think of is that what we do uh, can be also uh, uh, interesting for you because especially in terms of basic reproduction, we study a lot of different species. We have a huge you know, knowledge in terms of comparative uh, reproductive biology. And I think this is a key to really understand and to address some of the infertility issues that you can have also in domestic livestock. Uh, what's interesting also is that, you know, we are uh, sometimes dealing, of uh, we, we have in our wild population animals that are extremely different, so we call that, you know, the patient-to-patient -patient variations in terms of anatomy, physiology, or even in, in terms of infertility. So sometimes we have to customize also the, just the treatment or the approaches to these animals, which is also extremely uh, interesting. And we had to develop uh, some kind of uh, unique tools in our area, and I was referring earlier to the non-invasive hormone monitoring using uh, fecal and, and, and uh, urine uh, metabolites. And we also have, as you could see, for the elephant to develop some, some uh, new instruments. Pregnancy diagnostics is also a big deal for us because I was referring to the panda where we cannot really use the progesterone as an indicator of pregnancy. So we are testing, screening different types of prote proteins, peptides that are circulating in the blood that are also excreted in the urine. And we are really trying to find those new indicators that could be at some point interesting also for you in terms of understanding you know, early embryonic clots, for example. And now, as I said, also we are really integrating you know, bioinformatics and 
and modeling for the genetic management of those small population. And I think this is also directly applicable to the heritage breeds where you also face the same kind of issues of having a small number of animals to, to reproduce. So here in terms of still to try to illustrate how you know, what we do can be inspiring to you. Um, I would like to, to briefly talk about what we've done in cheetahs. In captivity, uh, we have the problem of uh, those old females that really do not reproduce, and even if we can see that they have regular uh, ovarian cycles, they are in estrus, but they do not reproduce naturally, and even if we do artificial insemination, nothing. So. We did some studies um, uh, 10 years ago, starting 10 years ago with my, with my colleagues, and first of all, we looked at you know, the oocyte quality. We wanted to know, is it an, a problem of oocyte quality? And actually, we confirmed that oocytes even produced from uh, an old cheetah female are still good quality. They're gonna still form uh, uh, embryos in, uh, in vitro. However, uh, when, sorry, when we looked at the, um, the uterus, the uterine environment, that's where we saw really the difference because we have this huge issue of uterine um, hyperplasia, especially in the epithelium, in old females. So, and that's the problem that we have because, so here, you know, this is not even the lumen. Those are the really the glands and the lumen is just here. So this is not really the right environment, of course, for development and <coughs> of early embryo and then implantation of these embryos. So, that's also something that we are trying to address because we think that that hyperplasia is kind of related to these kind of a successive, you know, um, uh, waves of estrogens that the female has been exposed to during her life without never reproducing, actually. Also, something that's really interesting uh, in cats, I was talking about the fact that the cats also are different, but you can see here, you know, we did those studies really long time ago trying to, to find, to, to look at the best, the optimal, optimal uh, simulation protocol, so we use ECGHCG really to stimulate the, the <coughs> first to stimulate the, the follicular uh, growth and then the ovulation. Uh, but you can see even, you know, f uh, there is no consistency between the dosage and the size uh, of the animal. So again, that shows you that whenever we start to work with a species, it's extremely difficult to translate one results to, uh, from a species to, to another one. And then, of course, I was talking about trying to increase the different, you know, the um, options for fertility preservation. And um, cryobiology, as I said, is really different from one species to the other. It requires it require also really sophisticated equipment, especially for the storage and the maintenance of uh, of the, um, the collections of the frozen biomaterials. So we are uh, now exploring really heavily desiccation and storage at room temperature. And I think this is also something that could be really uh, great for, for the industry at some point. Of course, there is already some preliminary results showing that DNA samples, blood products, somatic cells, even sperm cells can be dried and uh, uh, store that uh, uh, cold temperature, but not freezing temperature. But what we were interested in is uh, trying to do that for the egg, because the problem we have in our species, and here is just a comparison, the cat is the, the only kind of uh, exotic species here. Huh? And the problem we have is that, um, like in other mammals, uh, it's a large cell, the egg is a large cell that has a lot of water, a really complex cytoskeleton, there is the, um, the zona pellucida, and so far, there is not a success, not, not a single publication reporting the success of freezing thawing of egg, and then after that, fertilization um, and, and embryo development. This is absolutely incredible how far behind we are, but no matter what, <laughs> that's why we are trying to, 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 to get to reach the success through other way, and that's how we, have, we are developing really the just, you know, the preservation of the germinal vesicle. We don't care about the cytoplasm or about the, um, the zona pellucida. We are just interested in the maternal genome that then after that we can transfer into a fresh recipient egg. And um, you will see here 
that we've been developing this uh, microwave technique. So it, it's a little bit like a, a microwave that you can have in your kitchen, except that it's only uh, sending pulses on the samples that are the suspension containing the, the germinal vesicle. And it uh, allows like that to have a more homogeneous drying. And of course, the, what instead of a cryoprotectant, we are using a, a, a xeroprotectant, which is a triadose, which is a, a, a natural sugar that's used by some microorganisms to resist really dried uh, conditions. And by doing so, we've been able to show that uh, we are able to maintain and uh, to preserve uh, a pretty decent DNA integrity of the, the germinal vesicle. And then after that, when we inject those germinal vesicle into um, uh, fresh eggs, we can have those reconstructed oocytes that can be fertilized. And then after that, that can form uh, embryos. This is research in the domestic yet, by the way. And uh, we have not been able to uh, yet to, to apply that to any other uh, species, but again, I think it's uh, really encouraging. And we've been also able uh, to do the same for the cat sperm. Again, <laughs> those are not super good looking embryos, but uh, still, they are embryos. And that we got, you know, after sperm injection with sperm that was dried using that technique, stored at room temperature for several weeks, and then injected uh, with, um, with, uh, within the oocytes. Okay, so going to even to the next step, we're trying also to understand the epigenetics. I mean, we all talk about genomics and uh, DNA sequences, but you know that what really condition the phenotype of an animal is really the access to the, to the DNA for the transcription factors. And the transcription factors, they can only access the DNA as long as you have some specific, you know, radicals or, or histone, you know, modifications that are allowing the access to, to the DNA. So this, you know, this uh, vast, you know, amount of, of factors, they are called the epigenetic factors. And we know that they are also transmitted from one generation to the other. And interestingly enough, what we've been able to show in, again, in some, in the, our carnival model is that really during the spermatogenesis or during the uh, follicular genesis, the sperm and the egg respectively are acquiring the competence really uh, because of some changes of the epigenetics. So now, when I was talking about the fact that we want really to maximize the number of genome from a given donor, what we are thinking of doing is uh, to try, and that's what we've already started to do, is that whatever we collect from ovarian tissue or testicular tissue, instead of trying to do this really long-term in vitro culture to produce mature sperm or, or oocytes, we are just manipulating the epigenetic and trying to make sure to switch them to a more competent you know, state immediately. So this is just an illustration of uh, <clears throat> this is one of the key factor in the germinal vesicle that has to be really uh, triggered in order to, for the germinal vesicle to be competent. So there are even more, you know, other new horizons that we are exploring for uh, animal conservation and, and wild species. Uh, we are now really interested in monitoring the vaginal microbiome and to try to understand how it re it's connected with uh, ovarian activity or physiological status or even pregnancy. That could be a way maybe to monitor the, the, the pregnancy in some uh, species. We also are working uh, with bioengineers in those nanotechnologies or those uh, um, systems to monitor, to do some remote sensing of temperature or pH, either in the body or in the, in the vagina. And of course, we are using, uh, you know, I was talking about epigenomics uh, and even genomics. We are using, we are generating a lot of data uh, for our species. So now we are also uh, facing the issue of the big data that we have to manage and to store and to interpret. So honestly, at this point, we need the help of huge, you know, uh, tools in, in bioinformatics. So, to finish now, I would like to uh, re-emphasize the fact that we need really to build more bridges 
uh, between our communities because, of course, uh, there are really mutual benefits. And so why? Why do we need, again, to, to build those bridges? Because, as I said at the beginning, we share, we share the same goal. We want to produce, really, healthy babies, and we want to make sure that uh, they are also genetically uh, valuable. We want also to solve some of complex fertility issues that we are, you know, uh, observing in some, some, some animals, especially in some uh, females. Uh, we need more preservation options, and we need also techniques that are also cost-effective, and if possible, so we want methods that are field-friendly. And when I was talking about desiccation or uh, storage at room temperature of sperm or egg, I mean, this is something absolutely fantastic and that could have a huge, you know, uh, impact on the day-to-day the -day, uh, operations. And again, <laughs> why also? Because, as I said, related to the heritage, because we have sometimes also to, you know, uh, deal with small populations. So how can we build more bridges? Well, more comparative studies, of course. We need to work together, I think, into, into this um, uh, integration of the new technologies like genomics and reproduction. I think it's a little bit uh, stupid of us so far because that, I think I, I confess that my community hasn't been really open to the other community, but we really need to work with you on the fact that how to integrate really the genomic tools now into the, the, the assessment of fertility and reproduction. We need also to make sure that the data, the big data that we are generating are standard and that we can, of course, exchange them. We need more communication, uh, especially about the biobank use and maintenance because, um, of course, at, in your area, you're almost at the, the commercial industrial level, but we are a little bit far behind, but we have a lot to, to learn. But altogether, I think what's really important for the sustainability of our biobanks and the programmatic also sustainability of those biorepository, we better have also to communicate with the larger community, including uh, human reproduction and human biobanking. Of course, you know, we need to, to have more breeder uh, uh, connections with breeder associations and also wildlife uh, ranches. And um, <clears throat> of course, more uh, connections between the practitioners and the societies workshops, uh, exchange lecture, and that's why I'm so happy to be here with you today because uh, I think I'm helping to, 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 to make this uh, bridge between the two community within, you know that within the International Embryo Technology Society, there is a committee about uh, non-domestic species and endangered species. Uh, so that's kind of uh, something uh, really interesting. The Society for Study of Reproduction uh, doesn't really deal a lot with, uh, with uh, wildlife and they are more like uh, interested in, in basic biology. But again, I think it's really important to be aware of what's going on and make sure that we can also share you know, information. And last but not least is really the cross training. Training you know, the young people, professionals, and make sure that we have people who are you know, can be really good at artificial insemination in a dairy cow, but also have some knowledge, you know, in, in other species. I think that would help a lot in order to make some, some progress to have this kind of a dual competency uh, in professionals. So to conclude, um, this is leading a little bit to, this is my last slide leading to, okay, how do we see from our perspective what's gonna be the fer fertility preservation in the 21st century? Well, in terms of biodiversity conservation, we keep facing new challenges every day. You know, we have the amphibian crisis with the disappearance of all, the extinction of the, all, all those amphibian species because of the chytrid fungus. Now we have the coral reef that's bleaching everywhere in the ocean. And we have also more demand because, of course, you know, we claim that we can uh, solve a lot of problems using assisted reproductions and, uh, and being uh, <coughs> a little bit more thorough about reproduction, but we have more and more demand from people. And of course, those people, they have really high expectations because they really believe that we can solve also all the problems with reproduction. But remember that what I said at the beginning, reproduction and assisted reproduction, this is just a small piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, biodiversity conservation. Um, of course, we need 
more fundamental knowledge in terms of you know, discovering you know, new mechanisms and new physiological traits. We need new tools and integration, really, of those tools into the conservation effort. And what's really important also to us, uh, it's to work at the intersection of disciplines. I was talking to collab uh, about collaboration with uh, bioengineers, for example, and this has been extremely uh, fruitful and productive. But also, uh, again, uh, back to the, these uh, building bridges, I mean, it's you know, working at the inter intersection of communities. And of course, uh, last but not least, in terms of you know, intellectual uh, uh, productivity and also the possibility of getting more money, we need also to show that there are mutual benefits between wild and domestic species. It's probably more beneficial for people like me who are working on exotic species and who are struggling to really raise money for the programs that we have. But when we say, for example, but you know, what we're developing is also beneficial to domestic species, to you know, meat production or, 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 or milk production, this is always you know, changing the deal and we can get you know, some, some more funding. And actually the same with human reproduction, actually. So I would like to finish with, uh, you know, this is our campus in Front Royal, Virginia. This is the, the group over there. I have my lab uh, at the Veterinary Hospital, uh, downtown Washington, D.C. I would like to thank, of course, the colleagues from the SVF Foundations who have been able to help us to, uh, to build this new facility in, in uh, Front Royal, uh, funding agencies and, and partners internationally. Thank you for your attention.